I can't. Welcome, welcome. Come on in, come on in. Today's talk is about anxiety relief. I want you to imagine Superman or Superwoman sitting in a bedroom. I'm just too anxious. I just, I don't want to go up there. You know, it's cold. I might hit a plane. Don't get me started on the clouds. I just want to stay here. Anxiety robs us. And in that case, the freedom of flying. So this talk is all about how we deal with anxiety. And prior to me starting this video, this is my first YouTube video, I was really anxious. And at the beginning of this, I feel anxious. I feel anxious here. I feel here. I will explain where that comes from further into the video. The important point is, is that Anxiety is a normal state. It's a normal state of being. It's when it becomes chronic as opposed to what I call superpower anxiety that it becomes a problem. I've lived a lot of my life consumed with anxiety. I've lived a lot of my life completely without it. And I think I have a good understanding of why that happens and how we need to live. So. Today's talk is about anxiety, about the ways we get relief for it, and I'm going to give you an anxiety toolkit at the end, which is three different ways that I practice and know myself for how we deal with anxiety, and how we can move that energy and play with it more, rather than letting it consume us. So if you're anxious, like I am now, you could come with me now and you could look at the timestamp for the Anxiety Toolkit and you could do some of those exercises. So I'm going to stop now and I'm going to do some and then I'm going to come back. Hi, I'm back. Anxiety superpower versus chronic anxiety versus chronic anxiety. The moving from needing anxiety relief to anxiety giving you wings. I've spent 60 years of my life trying to understand why is the world like it is? Why are we like we are? Why do we suffer? Why do we have trauma? Who am I? I have lots of experience of making mistakes. Each mistake has taught me something. And each mistake has made me more of me and giving me hope for this world that we live in. And I'm excited to be sharing my wisdom with you, to my sharing my insights. And I hope that this will give you the life that you want. I like to keep things simple. So I use the ACT process. Awareness, connection, transformation. You're going to see that in action um, at the end of this video, or towards the end of it. Um, and it's simple. Life is actually simple. The world presents everything as complex. It's actually not. Um, awareness, connection, transformation, it's how we grow, it's how we heal. It's part of life. Life is based on this principle. Life doesn't happen to us. Life happens with us. What is anxiety? According to the Oxford Dictionary, a state of uneasiness accompanied by dysphoria. Dysphoria is a state of worry or general unhappiness. Body signs and symptoms of tension. Focused on apprehension of possible failure, misfortune or danger. Fairly good description of anxiety. The opposite of dysphoria is euphoria. Intense excitement and happiness. So interesting, two sides of the same coin. Excitement, anxiety. I'm going to talk about that later in the video. So let's look at superpower anxiety. Superpower anxiety is when an event happens. We respond to it and we return to calm. The anxiety is the reminder that we need to pay attention to something that's happening. Chronic anxiety is when we're constantly thinking. We're in our heads. We're going from 
what might happen in the future to what has happened in the past. And we end up in this negative feedback loop. And it's like a cycle we get trapped in. And often people say it's in front of my head, it's like, you know, this is where my anxiety is. The thoughts are here, not necessarily the anxiety. So, the problem with chronic anxiety is that it disconnects us from our feelings. We're in our thoughts and we can't get back into our body and feel what's going on. Something has happened that needs to be addressed and we're not able to connect with that again to resolve it. We're caught in uh, our head we're trying to figure out how to deal with the feelings. Uh, no, feelings are for feeling. Figuring out is for thoughts and they're different things. So let's start with um, looking at how the body works. So if you imagine my body, our bodies, are like a complex computer, millions of nerve endings that are sensors. They sense the environment, they sense sound, the weight of gravity, temperature, light frequencies, colour. And this is happening every second of the day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, forever, well, until our body goes. The raw experience is what the nervous system carries through the body. And it's interpreted by three brains. So we often think it's just the brain in our head. But there's a gut brain, there's a heart brain, and there's the brain in our head. So the idea is that the raw experience is giving us information. We need to do something with that information. Maybe we need to move, we need to eat, we need to um, respond to a threat. And the body then has a reaction to whatever the events are. That's appropriate. So our feelings in our body, the sensations that we often call emotions, is our barometer. You know how you, you, you know if you're okay, because I feel okay. I can, you know, I feel uneasy about something. I'm not okay. I, something's wrong with the way that someone did something or said something, or I just get a strange feeling. We have this complex feeling system in us, which is tied in very much with our nervous system. And it's part of our evolution. It's part of how we've learned to live in the world. The making sense of it and interpreting and categorizing by our brain, especially the frontal lobe, is relatively new in evolutionary traits. So back to um, feeling. So when we get trapped with thinking in our brain um, and we're in the game, talking about anxiety, we're thinking about the future, what might be going to happen to us or the past, what hasn't happened or what has happened to us. And we're trying to resolve something. And we're stuck with our thoughts instead of being connected with our body, with our feelings, because of the feelings are the bit that makes us okay, not our thoughts. Our thoughts are designed to interpret the world and decide on actions and how to figure things out. You know, they're part of us that can figure stuff out. So we create an impossibility. The anxiety that's chronic, that just keeps on going in that feedback loop, has an impossible task. It's trying to resolve an emotion that it doesn't know doesn't have the skill to do. And we become disassociated with our barometer, our emotional states in our body, and life sucks. You know, the energy levels drop and you get this brain fog, you just can't sort of think clearly. Um, and the brain in your head sucks half of the energy. So that when you eat and you create this energy in your body, half of it goes to the brain. So, you know, when you get really tired and you can't sleep, your brain's using all energy trying to think its way out of something that it's unable to do. This is what we're calling chronic anxiety. So what do we do when we have this? We try to find a way to fix it, try a way to deal with it. Often we will self-medicate, like have a drink, take a drug, have sex, work really hard, something that will dissipate that anxiousness in our brain. We might go to the GP and the GP will give us, could give us medication. Um, there are lots of natural ways which I'm going to talk about in the anxiety toolkit, especially breath and mindfulness and body posture and how we connect with ourselves. 
those are the ways that we naturally do, which we seem to have lost a little bit of experience of how we do that. When we have an initial experience, emotional energy is created, and then we use that to drive some sort of change. That's a normal process. That's superpower anxiety. Why doesn't it happen like that? Well, that's all about FDLs and trauma. So let's start with trauma. I'll come back to what an FDL is. Trauma, according to the dictionary, a deeply distressing or disturbing experience. Trauma isn't the experience itself. Something happens to us and we have a response to it that's severe, you know, deeply distressing, like having a car accident. But it's not the event. It's not that trauma of the event. It's how we can work through the process of it. So uh, if we can't process the emotional change that happens in the body, the experience gets trapped. It doesn't get resolved. Now, often this is childhood, because in your childhood you lack control of your life. You lack the skills to be... Um, well, as a child, if you're given free reign to feel what you feel and to, to move through an experience that's hard for you, um, which often little kids are able to do because they get really upset about something, blah, and then it's gone. If that gets restricted, if your parenting was poor or your culture somehow ostracised you and you internalise that energy without being able to resolve it, you have what we call unresolved trauma. Bits, emotional charges in us that are stuck. What happens with that is that becomes uh, a pattern of thinking wrapped around that. And our brain gets used to thinking this is how the world is. And that can be passed on intergenerationally. Think of inter inter there's talk about intergenerational trauma. And that's like uh, hereditary traits. You know, if your um, mother had breast cancer and you're a woman, you could get, you've got an increased chance of getting breast cancer. Coding into the DNA of life experience, it's also with trauma. They've done experiments with rats where they exposed rats to trauma experiences and then their offspring exhibited the same sort of responses, traumatic responses, when there was no trauma. They had learned it from their parents, it had been passed on through the DNA. So. This becomes normalised. Often trauma is little things that happen. So um, maybe school was hard for you. Maybe the way your parents treated you. Maybe um, the culture you're in treated you poorly. You learn a way to be as a child because you don't know anything else. And that becomes your normal. Uh, any little trauma that gets built up, which creates a pattern of how we think, gets normalised as a way of being. And we all do this. So for me example, um, when I was a little kid, I was born in Australia, and before I came to New Zealand at five, we lived in two places. And by the time we'd moved to the second place, we were fairly isolated. There was two brothers. I was the oldest. My mother had had postnatal depression didn't quite attempt suicide, but had planned it and then changed her mind. And I know this because she apologised to, to, to me about it. And Dad was off working. He was building his career. So I learned that I had to take care of Mum and I had to be brave. And I learned how to react emotionally. I was very in touch with being aware of my mother because the risk of her leaving and having to take care of her. Uh, I didn't go to kindergarten, so I didn't talk a lot. And I had one friend, and that friend was a little girl who used to talk to me all the time. So my experience by the time I came to New Zealand was people talk at me, and I just sit there and listen. I don't really have to talk. There wasn't a great need for it. Then I was put straight into school. My school experience was I had no idea how to do that, and I just closed that. And for two years, I didn't talk. I eventually changed schools and it was picked up that I needed uh, a, uh, a speech therapist. That traumatised me for a long time. I always thought that I was somehow less than. 
uh, my understanding of how to talk was completely different. And I would very easily get triggered back into that experience of being this defenseless kid who just couldn't cope with school. Doing this video was exactly that. Overwhelmed with anxiety. And I had to calm myself and bring myself into me and uh, acknowledge that part of me that's a little kid that's frightened and to know that it's okay. I'm here now and I'm doing this and it's okay. So, what's an FTL? Because I've talked a lot about trauma. An FDL stands for Fake Designer Label. So, what does that mean? Well, designer labels, you know, if you think about designer labels in fashion, they're prestigious, they're unique, one of a kind. There's something that we tend to want to have because they, uh, they all tend to last, they're luxurious, all those things that go with them. However, when you get a fake designer label, like if you've ever been through some of the Asian countries, you might be walking down the street and you'll get a Rolex and it'll only be $20 and it looks exactly like a Rolex. And then you check the time on it about three days and the second hand's fallen off and it doesn't work. Fake designer labels. Now, we create personas inside ourselves of who we are. And these are based on, as I said about these experiences, that are unresolved and we create ways of being. But there are fake designer labels. They're not who we actually are. So we internalize this fake version of ourselves based on some trauma that's unresolved. But it's not who we actually are. The original me, you, is hidden behind this fake designer label. So trauma is not bad. Our lives depend on it. So Think about being born. When you are first created, you're in a, uh, inside a human body. You are connected to another person physically. It's warm, sounds are muted. Uh, there's no sensation of um, having less or more when it comes to food or water. And you are in a liquid. Within the space of a few minutes, you are pushed out. And you are cold bright lights, uh, and you have to breathe. You're in a gas environment, a completely different change. So that's really traumatic. But we don't have to go to therapy for our birth. Why? The brain isn't developed sufficiently to resist the trauma. It's a natural process. So the body just knows what to do, just like a woman knows woman's body knows how to give birth. So trauma is necessary for survival. If you think of it as like a, a tool for transformation, without it, we wouldn't change and grow. I mean, I don't want to spend my whole life inside a womb. I did want to come out and be able to walk and experience and do videos like this. How do we change anxiety? How do I get anxiety relief? Well, I'm going to give you three tools. We're going to use posture, we're going to use mindfulness, we're going to use breath, connection. This is the ACT process, awareness, connection, transformation. And I've named them flipping the coin, open heart surgery and finding felicity. I'm going to do one, two, three. I'm going to start with flipping the coin. I suggest you try all three. I suggest you just go with it. There's no right or wrong with this. I've been doing this for a long time, so I might look like, oh, he's really good at doing that, and I'm really bad at it. So the important thing is to be gentle with yourself, to be kind with yourself, and be with yourself. So I'm starting to feel a little bit calmer. Now, I want you to think about something you're anxious about now. So for me, I'm going to pick the anxiety I had before starting to do this video. This is me publicly speaking to the world. And the little kid was really anxious. So in here, in my left hand, it doesn't have to be your left hand, I can feel the anxiety of that little kid. And I'm going to hold that. Now in my other hand, I'm going to take an experience that's really exciting. So I'm going to imagine my future where this 
video has gone viral and it's got 2 million views. Okay, I'm, not, I'm eternally optimistic. And I can feel the excitement in here and I can feel the anxiousness here. Now I want you to emerge the, uh, um, I want you to imagine there's an emotion cord. It's like a cord between anxiety and excitement. And I want you to imagine that the excitement is coming down that cord into your anxiety. Can you get it all the way? Does it get stuck some of the way? I want you to really notice where it is and to notice if you can take that excitement and take it into the anxiety. For me, I've just done that. I can feel them blending. So I'm sort of feeling this amazing energy and I'm not actually sure whether it's anxiety or excitement. If it's stuck, like somewhere on the way down to where the anxiety is, try this. Boom. So, smash anxiety with excitement. That's the first one, open heart surgery. So, same thing, you're standing up or sitting down, I will do this uh, sitting down. So I've got my feet on the ground, I'm feeling relaxed and I'm feeling grounded. So I'm going to focus on my anxiety. Uh, I'm, again, I'm going to take the anxiety from, okay, I'm nervous about doing this, I feel really anxious. And I'm going to put my arms apart and I'm going to tilt my palms slightly so they're putting, facing up towards the sky. My head is slightly back and the idea is my chest is very open. So my heart space is very open. And I'm just going to allow a feeling of coming into my heart space and a containing of energy open to receiving from the universe or whatever way you want to describe that. So I feel calmer. Now if you feel coming into your heart that you feel sad, there's probably some unresolved grief. That's okay. Just sit with the sadness. If it's too much, stop. I feel the love in my heart and that helps me feel less anxious. So that was open heart surgery. And number three, finding felicity. I think this is probably the most powerful of the three. It comes from the 12 stages of healing. And I'm going to do stage one. Uh, it's simple and it's powerful. Same thing, breathing in and out preferably your nose, and just slowing it down. And we're going to get our palm, one palm on the other. So if, can you see this? You might better see it better from that hand, that angle. I've got that, and I'm putting it in the middle of my chest. It's almost right in the middle. And I'm going to breathe into here. For me, I imagine a coin under my palm. And when I'm breathing into there, I can feel the coin and I can push my chest up and then I can pull my chest down and push down with my hands. And I focus, I have to focus my mind into here. So this is the mindfulness, is bringing you inside yourself rather than outside with the anxiety. So I'm just going to practice, stop talking for a bit. So I feel nicely connected. I've isolated this part of me. Don't worry if your breath goes to other places, that's okay. Now, that's the first one. I'll sort of shake it off a bit. Okay, the mic's not going to work here. So at the bottom of your sternum, which holds your rib cages together, palm, palm on palm. Right on that spot. Now for me, this one's actually a little bit more connected. It's easier for me to do this one. When I started doing this process, I had no idea how to connect with this. I had no idea how to isolate this part of my chest, my body, and to feel what was in there. So, so some people, this may be the easiest to connect to. Just notice what it's like to be here. It's the same thing, you're trying to isolate this part and just breathing into here, mindfulness, 
your thoughts, your awareness into here. So what I'm feeling is in here, it's strong. I feel a good connection with this part of me. Shake it off. Now the belly, right on the belly button. And same thing. This one generally is easy for most people. However, some people really struggle to be here. If you struggle, that's fine. Be with whatever you can with it. If you can't, you can't, that's fine. came out for me when I was breathing into here is doing the haka. If you're not a, not a person who knows what the haka is, watch the All Blacks. It's the um, performance dance they do before a rugby game. It feels like it's this sort of energy. So I've breathed into three different places. Each place is a completely different type of energy in your body. And, um, symbolically it's very different. If you look at chakras, that's one way of looking at the energy in those different parts of the body. So out of this, two things. One, which feels the most safest? What's the part that you can come into and just be with? When you're feeling unsafe, that you can just stop and be in this place. You know, you might feel that being into your belly, oh, that really grounds me and makes me feel good. Or being here, it brings me into my love of my heart and that makes me feel good. So... That's the first thing, knowing a safe place to come into, being mindful in that place, breathing in that place, and just slowing down. The second thing is, where are you disconnected from? Where are you suffering? Suffering is about being disconnected. Anxiety is about being disconnected. We want to connect with the feeling. My anxiousness is here. If this was a place where I was really feeling my anxiety, at the point of Connecting is to connect with something that we feel. If the suffering comes from the disconnection from what we feel. Once we connect and really experience it, we're back into our emotional body. We're able to feel okay because we're not resisting and fighting this emotional state. So I hope you've enjoyed those three. Uh, what's next? Well, be brave, take a chance, add a comment or learn more about these tools, go and visit my website. There's a link up here. And look for the free offer. You have to find it. And also, go to the description and there are some links. There's some links to other resources that I think are great and are worth watching when it comes to um, getting support around anxiety. And if you're still here now, and you're like you've come right to the end, then I would really appreciate it if you subscribe because, I mean, you're here. And I hope to see you soon. Thanks. Bye.